Hey guys, before we dive into the show, I wanted to tell you about the perfect trailer queue blueprint, which is 100% free and you could download it right now over at the trailermusicschool.com forward slash blueprint. Now this blueprint will help you to completely understand the structure of trailer music, how to build tracks that will be more licensable and have more impact and capture the right people's attention. So whenever you start writing a cue, make sure you've got this blueprint to hand and you can use it to help speed up your process, feel more confident that you've crafted a well-structured trailer cue before you send it off to that publisher or editor or supervisor. Okay, let's get into the episode. One man, one microphone, and one medium-sized coffee. Welcome to the Trailer Music Composers Podcast. Welcome to the Trailer Music Composers Podcast. Uh, Today, guys, I am absolutely thrilled and honoured and as uh, as I'm sure you guys will know, having a huge fanboy moment here, uh, because on the show I have the one and only Christian Henson. Uh, Christian, it is such an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Um, my listeners absolutely love everything you do, as do I. So thank you for coming on, firstly. Um, I'm blushing. <laughs> Way too much. Thank you yeah. so much for having me. Oh, dude, it's a pleasure. So I, I like to kick start with uh, the show, usually asking a silly question. Now, this kind of stems from usually when I'm drinking, I ask people what vegetable they would be and why. Uh, so that kind of progressed onto the podcast as what instrument you would be and why. But as you are quite a special guest, in my opinion, uh, <laughs> I'm going to ask you, Christian, if you were going to be any of your Spitfire libraries, which one would you be and why? Mm. Is it kind of what I want to be or what I just would be? That's up to you. That's the beauty of the question. Glass and steel. Oh, nice. Which Any is made reason? from kitchenware. And I think it's because I'm I'm a bit DIY, really. <laughs> and a bit and a bit bonkers. And yeah, there's something kind of very me about that library. Nice. Great choice, great choice. I was I, I have to say you answered that very quickly. I before before the interview, I was sat there thinking, which one would I be? I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would probably have to say, and this isn't any like reference to me being classy or anything, uh, the the original re- release of Spitfire Albion. Okay. The very first one. Uh and I think because there's <laughs> this sounds really egotistical. It, you know, there's elements of beauty there, but it's also got those the kind of rawness to it yeah which i absolutely loved uh so yeah there we go Brilliant. right okay so i don't know how much everyone in the audience knows about your story so i think it would be good to start at the very beginning <laughs> not not conception beginning you know <laughs> being more like how did you get into composing um well i Grew up in West London, Shepherd's Bush. I went to a really rough school. Basically, my dad was boarding school educated and was allergic to the private school system. So uh, inadvertently sent us to this Borstal um, in uh, in Holland Park, which sounds posh, but it was basically the sink school for the whole of Kensington and Chelsea. Uh, so all of the naughty kids went there. Um, but it was very, very well stocked um, because it had a very large student body. Um, I did piano lessons from about five, but I never really picked up reading music. And I didn't realise that I didn't pick up reading music. I thought I was, but I wasn't. I definitely was just doing it by ear. And um, so when I left school, I'm I'm skipping a bit. So, yeah, what what happened is I I kind of started getting into computers and stuff because there was a good computer room at the school. And then there was this great uh, music department and they had this thing called Cubase. And uh, I mean, this is considering I'm 50 years old, you know, to be using this stuff since I was probably about 12. It's pretty incredible. Um, and uh, so I started building up a little kind of home setup and really got into the technology of music. I went to see a film called Flash Gordon, uh, which had the music by Queen. And it was very, it was very highly publicized that Queen 
um, did the music for it. And I remember coming out of the cinema and saying to my dad, oh, I, I'm going to join a band so I can do music for film. And he said, oh, you don't have to be in a band. It's a natural job. And I remember it feeling like the kind of clouds had parted and kind of going, that's definitely what I want to do. Um, so uh, I, the normal route would be to go to music college. And uh, it became quite clear after doing my music A level that I didn't really possess the, the foundational needs to be able to go to music, um, music college. So I just kind of gave up and became a baker. And oh. that's not that's not the most common route into composition. Um, and then I I started a, a duo. Back in those days, you couldn't buy backing tracks. So basically, if you wanted to go out and play in pubs, and there's a maximum of two people allowed to perform in pubs in this country, um, uh, you had to make your own backing tracks. And I inadvertently, because we did some quite good music, lots of Stevie Wonder and lots of theme, uh, TV theme tunes and stuff. We were called Crafty and Crutch, by the way. And, <laughs> That's um, a great name. <laughs> and uh, I kind of inadvertently learned about composition and harmony, kind of like a car mechanic learns how to a car works by taking it to pieces and putting it back together again. Um, and it also made me quite a good programmer. And um, that led me on to um, meeting this lady called Maggie Rodford, um, who took a shine to me and my current, my business partner at the time. And, um, and she said, you know, there are lots of composers looking for drum programmers because William Orbit had done a score and the whole massive attack thing had happened and that amazing score that David Arnold did. Um, and so these kind of slightly more traditional composers, in order to keep up with the Joneses, uh, were looking for drum programmers. And that's how I kind of got into film composing. I, I guess I assisted and programmed for Anne Dudley of Art of Noise fame for three years. Yep. And then from that... Uh, worked with Rupert Gregson Williams and then Harry Gregson Williams, who gave me a go on a scene he was struggling with, which Tony Scott kind of then fell in love with my treatment um, and peppered it all over the score. And that really got got me going into, into writing film music. I think the th thing I also haven't mentioned is I lived very close to the BBC and that kind of became the factory on the hill. So... Um, when my friends all came back from university, they all got, got sucked into the jam factory on the hill. And um, they'd heard that I was writing music to picture. I was actually, between you and I and your audience, writing porn scores. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, so they, they started giving me spots and stuff on like travel programs and, and that kind of stuff. So that started my factual entertainment career as well. But it was it was meeting Harry Gregson Williams that got me into film, um, and then from that point on, it was largely feature films, until I started working on TV drama um, with I think the, the first kind of major TV drama I did was called Lost in Austin, and then from that I got the Poirot gig, um, which was absolutely fantastic. You're, you're muted, I think. Yes, you're muted, Richard. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> That's my, my two-year-old's in the back and she's found her whistle. So uh, <laughs> I thought I should probably mute this whilst he's talking. Um, okay, so where are, where are we in, in the timeline here when you got the Poirot gig? Um, I guess that was probably about 11, 12 years ago. So um, I think I went professional as 25. Um, so I've been at it for about 25 years. And um, yeah, it was what was great about the Poirot gig was it was the point at which I was working with people who were at the highest degree of professionalism. So they really understood the process. So I was able to be a real craftsperson. And it felt like it was the moment I, it felt like I could actually, you know, my carpentry skills had got me to a point where I could be build really good quality um, furniture. I've always said that media composition is a craft before it's an art. And if you can bring some artistry into it, so so much the better but you're just basically helping people tell a story and Poirot got me really match fit working very quickly very complex um, plots lots of light motifs um, working around dialogue which is almost continuous in Poirot 
Um, and it just was utterly, I thought it was going to be the most fun I've ever had uh, writing music for picture until I got the Inside Number no. 9 gig, which uh, I've been doing for, I think, nearly 10 years now, which is absolutely fantastic. Wow. Okay, so at what point did you start introducing sampling? Was it right at the very beginning? I mean, that must have been early on, uh, especially yeah. if you're making your own backing tracks, you know. Well, yeah, the... The sample. Well, you have to understand that back then, when I was what it would I would have been twenty two, twenty three when I started all that stuff. Um, you couldn't carry a sample around with you because it would be too valuable, but also it wouldn't hold enough samples. So I was actually programming on Cubase on my Atari ST, and then I would fire the MIDI file into this thing called a Yamaha MIDI filer which was just this black box that you put floppy disks in that played back MIDI files into my Ensonic SQR Plus um, uh, synth module, which was multi-timbral. Um, and the hi-hats weren't very good at that, so all of my hi-hats came from this boss doctor rhythm. Um, but I did get into sampling early. My father was in a film called Witchfinder General, which is one of the, the holy trinity of folk horror mm. in, this, um, in the UK. And um, a fantastic score was written by a guy called Paul Ferris, who then became very good friends with my dad. Um, and he decided, after having quite a checkered career, he decided to buy this thing called a Kurzweil XP, which was a, an insane sampler for its day, had great presets and stuff. But he fell on bad times, so um, I bought it off him with the money I made from a film I starred in when I was six. <laughs> <laughs> so I was allowed to get, get my hands on that money when I was 16, and I bought this Kurzweil K250 XP, and it had eight seconds of sample memory um, in the ROM, in the Randus Access memory, yep. um, at, in mono, and I think it was 12-bit, and it would never remember any of the samples I sampled. So it was more of a preset machine, but that's when I found the love for sampling. Can I just say, I love the fact that you remember all of the names of these things. <laughs> I'll be sort of going, I'm pretty sure it was a Casio of some kind. Uh, <laughs> but it, I was trying to remember the, the first sampling keyboard I had back in uh, early 90s. Oh, I, I, could, I could give you the entire running order it's i guess it's just because i'm so obsessed with it yeah yeah i i i'm always just like cool it makes a great noise i'll have that <laughs> <laughs> okay so you know sampling kind of kept, must have come in at you know as and when you were pr producing it but what point did it start to become spitfire so i became aware of spitfire when it was the invite only thing mm -hmm. yeah. um you know, it is like, oh, look at this amazing thing that we can't touch because <laughs> I'm not being invited. Uh, obviously, I was tremendously inexperienced back then as well. But uh, at what point did it did it start to kind of slowly separate, or do you think it's always been running in tandem? No, I think that basically what happened was when I started really working as a media composer, um, it was all always about finding a sonic hook that was interesting. I think it was a bit of a crutch that I relied on because I don't read music and I was writing these orchestral scores. And I think that my big selling point was I'm kind of this programmer who also does orchestral as opposed to the other way around. So most of my sampling up to that point had been nicking drum hits off records and sampling drums for people. But... Um, I, I think it was, it, it, I can't remember my first virtual instrument, but the one that sticks in my mind would have been, I know actually, it was basically, it was going to see Solaris, which is a seminal score by Cliff Martinez, yeah. where he used a lot of steel drums. Uh, and it's, you know, for a science fiction film, it was a bold move. And basically I, I, couldn't really work out how he'd made these sounds. So decided to go to a catering supply shop and buy up loads of bowls and and um, and kind of glasses and stuff. And just started making instruments out of these this kitchenware. And um, 
to this day, it's my go-to library for get out of jail free. And I think that's what sparked this sudden thing of like, you can make anything in the world a musical instrument. And that was really fascinating. Now, the virtual instrument thing happened when I went to see the Motorcycle Diaries with a score by Gustavo Santaolalla, um, who's now famous for um, scoring The Last of Us um, computer game series. And there was this guitar that sounded like it was made of glass. So I went to this local folk music shop called Hobgoblin, which is still there in Soho. And um, they said, oh, this is a Churango. So I bought it, but I don't play the guitar. So I got my brother to sample it. And I said, I want it to be really sketchy. I want it to be full of mistakes. And I want every single note to be different. I'd been fascinated with these kind of commercial sample libraries I was using, but couldn't understand why they were so perfect because no one plays perfectly in the middle of a performance. It's part of a performance. So I had this theory of, oh, um, if we make it imperfect, I wonder if it'll sound more realistic. Um, and he played it, and then I programmed it into uh, my sampler. And lo and behold, it was the only moment in my life I've ever said, this is life-changing, and it actually was. <laughs> And, and basically, I started being, becoming a bit of a troll on on various sampling for, forums, saying, "Why are people sampling in this way? Why are they close miking everything? Why are they not getting the room? Why is it every note exactly the same? It just sounds like synthesizers." Um, uh, to the point where I got kicked off this forum, and this chap called Paul Thompson um saw that I'd been kicked off and it was quite quite a big deal because I was quite a big kind of vociferous chap on these forums and uh, in the days before social media and um he found me on MySpace and said listen um I've just had this thing that I've done with a violin where I got the violinist to play every note completely differently and it just blew my mind I said well I'll send you send me that and I'll send you the Chirango. So we put them on CD-ROM and posted them to each other because internet was too slow in those days. Um, and then we got together in a pub and said, wouldn't it be good if we applied that mentality um, to some orchestral samples? And that's that's how it all began. Cue the beautiful music. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I, I, the thing is, I, I love when I hear people's stories and you hear these moments that at the time don't seem to have done anything you know but they are the you know those crossroads i don't want to say the word crossroads but you know like for instance when you came out of the cinema and you said to your dad you wanted to be in a band you know i can imagine most fathers responses being something akin to well it's very competitive (laughs) you know good luck with that son in retrospect, I think that that was his answer. <laughs> he just went, oh, you don't want to be in a band. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What you about a real film job, son? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I was, I've was. i got some young kids and I was trying to explain butterfly effect. And um, and it is it's definitely that. And I have to say, if there was, um, I mean, Paul Thompson, my now still co-founder of Spitfire Audio, he's got many superpowers, but he is the most tenacious human being I've ever met. And when something is decided, he just he just goes for it. And um, and I would have to say that I think tenacity is quite an important thing to have in our profession. This ability to grab onto something and then to finish it. Um, so yeah, I mean, the next day I woke up after getting a bit pissed with him in the pub. And um, I couldn't even remember agreeing to it. But my accountant rang me up and said, there's this guy called Paul who's asking for a lot of money. And, um, you know, it was my half of the first session. And, you know, Uh, next morning, let's do this. Now, was that first session just woodwind? Is that right? No, it was chamber strings, second violins. So it was us doing a proof of concept and we used those patches that Paul built by hand. Um, uh, we used those patches to, I basically said to Paul in the pub, and I do remember this, was I don't want to set up an effing business. Um, so uh, instead of us trying to sell, you know, 100 copies, why don't I just speak to the my A-list of friends who are kind of quite, you know, well-to-do and see if we can't do a, an exclusive, really high-priced um, library. And that, that's how it all began. And, you know, in, by not setting up a business, 
um, we inadvertently did the first thing you must do in business, which is create scarcity. Mm -hmm. um, so we had a lot of people pressing their noses up against the window going, oh, what's in there? Yeah. Oh, I remember doing that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I did a session, it was a session at Angel, and they actually no, it was, it was before that, it was before, um, I can't remember when it was, uh, but somebody had mentioned, oh, you, you know, you need to get, get the libraries from Spitfire, they were amazing, and I was like, oh, let me have a look, and it was like, I think you had uh, maybe just a single page website up, invite only, yeah, and yeah, as you said, looking at the, <laughs> looking at the glass, <sighs> One it day, very, Rich. It was very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, you know, it's, it's not just creating scarcity. Is it? It's it's people willing to pay up front was kind of the proof that you guys had something special. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think one of the, 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 the uh, people's initial interests with us was, and I think this really follows through as a as a strand through Spitfire, <laughs> is that we weren't that interested in making everything sound big. We, we wanted to make things sound beautiful and small. And this is why, you know, so we started with chamber strings and I think that we're, we're renowned for our chamber sounds. Um, but also these techniques like perfecting how to instruct flautando, which has become a, a, a real favourite, all the way along to recording a, a, a library called Tundra, where we were getting people to play as quietly as they could without producing a tone. Um, and so this kind of quiet and, and, and small was, was the opposite end of the sampling spectrum that hadn't really been investigated. Yeah, it was the, the third aspect that has always drawn me to the work you do is, is the character as mm -hmm. well. Quiet, small and full of character. Well, I, to be candid... Um, I don't think the producers will hear this, but I was really late on a TV show because I've, I've got an outgoing job that ran over. And um, I hadn't, you know, when your brain is just totally full with something else, I hadn't worked out how I was going to approach this TV series. They're very loose on the temp. It's a new franchise. And I just, I just didn't know where to start. You know, it was that blank screen thing. Well, it's not going to be orchestral and... I can't, I can't be trendy because I'm 50. Um, <laughs> there's nothing worse than like doing that kind of dad dancing at the wedding, albeit uh, in TV music style. But um, yeah, so I, I actually downloaded something that I hadn't tried before, which was my brother's library, Heirlooms. Um, which we'd, and I, I don't want this to become an advert, but it was uh, my brother's Keaton. He's a, a fantastic singer-songwriter and did this very interesting library. I downloaded it and um, just the ideas came flooding out. So I think that what I've realised all the way back to that kitchenware stuff is the true value of samples to jobbing composers who are on deadlines is that they're a genuine source of inspiration. Yes. Um, very well said. Um, I went and they're not inspiring if they're not characterful. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Suddenly it's about you having to really kind of work with them to, to get them to sound the way that you hear things in your head. Um, and I think that's a different way of working. Mm. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think I, I fell into that trap of purposefully not buying new libraries as a kind of like, I mean, you talk about this on your YouTube channel as well, restriction through limitation mm -hmm. and how the limitations in and of themselves can spark creative thinking but then sometimes when you get to that you then find yourself consistently restricting yourself in the exact same way yes uh so that's where those new libraries come in and plonk down and you go oh yeah I mean, <laughs> what, what i like doing is either creating a, a new set of sounds or or you know i remember the first time i did a score without symphonic strings with chamber strings just chamber strings and it was great because that in itself was really inspiring. But yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I, I think I often say on my vlog, um, uh, restricting people's resources makes them more resourceful. And I think that what's, you know, you can f play around with your sounds, create your samples. But I think if you restrict your, your band and go, okay, well, this five gigabytes of my four terabyte drive is all I'm going to use on this project. 
what you then do is rely on composition to tell the story as opposed to they want it a bit scarier i'll get that that symbol that i always get out when they when it's not scary enough so instead of just layering sounds to 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 tell the story what you're doing is actually um articulating it with with composition fab one of the things that's always uh, drawn me to you and your output and i'm i th- i'm speaking for quite a lot of people who are fans of yours as well uh, and in, in my audience is the fact that you are so open about your training as a composer you yeah. know it's not that you went through classical training and sort of land this job because you know this process this path that lots of people have chosen and anyone who's tried to get into tv score writing feature film writing you know you will encounter a lot of people who have had a traditional training in composition. But on the other side, there are people who explore composition outside of that remit. And I think that's one of the things that speaks to me from what you do as a vlogger and a you know composer. Well, I feel very strongly about this because... If you're humming something that no one else has hummed before, you've composed it. So everyone, everyone's done that and everyone is a composer. And I just I just find it infuriating that there's this horrific snobbery around music theory. Now, I respect and admire people who learn and are, are good at theory. You know, I've worked with Ben Valfish and he's just a, he's a savant. I mean, it's incredible. But it's just not the way that everyone learns, not least because not many people can afford it. And that's what I find infuriating. And it is this last bastion. It's being broken down, I would say, only in the last five years. It's the last bastion of of white male privilege. And it's just, it's nonsense. I'm using this analogy quite a lot at the moment, but when I go to an art shop, it's not because I'm a professional artist. It's because I like drawing or I'm buying some drawing equipment for my kids. And when I take that drawing equipment to my kids, with pencils and paper, I don't say, let's work on your, your um, penmanship for two years so you can do a still life. Um, and, I, you know, it's about drawing stuff from your, your imagination. And I think that composing, regardless, you know, and it's not even about it's not even about learning musical instruments. That's a different thing. And getting good at playing a musical instrument is is great. But, you know, I I hope I'm not blowing his cover. I think he did a Cribs where he admitted it. Martin Phipps, who's arguably one of the greatest um, uh, living media composers this country has ever produced, um, he can barely play the piano. He's like like really, really not, not great. So anyway, so it's not about learning musical instrument. It's just about, working out a way that you can compose music, which is one of the greatest pleasures a human being can experience. And, you know, so something that I'm really passionate about is is, is Spitfire's ability to open this up, to make the uh, the profession more diverse, both gender and and in background, um, but also just to to suggest to everyone that they can have a go at composing. And so that's something that we experienced during the pandemic is a, lots of people picked up our lab stuff and just started noodling and realising that it was a pleasurable experience. Sorry, that was a real... I'll, I'll get off the soapbox. but I do, please, I, please stay on because I'm... You know, <laughs> you're preaching to the choir. What makes me really cross is I've moved up to Scotland. I'm a, I'm a proud Londoner, but I moved up to Scotland and I'm now working with um, some of the most fantastic musicians I've ever worked with in my life. And it's from this amazing folk scene. It's called the traditional scene up here. This folk scene up here, this is just obscene. But none of them read. And they're some of the best musicians and composers I've ever worked with. And But, you know, believe you me, they can pick up a melody quicker than anyone from a conservatoire. I bet you that. Yeah, and then fill it with beautiful ornaments that you wouldn't have been able to write anyway. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, so, and so that you kind of go, no, yeah, that's that's. It's just odd that we're sold this this thing of you've got to read music, and I do. I mean, I, I've got a job that I've got to do, and I really wish I could read music. Um, so, you know, there's regrets there, but you can't 
teach an old dog new tricks. No. I think that the you've raised a really interesting, well, you raised quite a few interesting points, but the one I'm going to focus on is about uh, opening up this realm of composition and this kind of like traditional classical route, opening that up for composers. So I'll use myself as an example because, you know, I'm here. Uh, when I first started, uh, beginning of the millennium, <laughs> 2000s, early 2000s, when I first started, and that was sort of real. Everyone wanted Hans Zimmer, mm-hmm. everyone for everything. So back then, I was doing ads for t- you know TV ads rather than trailers and films. So you know, I had my cracked copy of Reason with the the sounds that came with Reason, which were for what they were okay, but they were awful. <laughs> it, as I was being asked to kind of have a Hans Zimmer inspired, inspired score for a banking advert and i kept coming across this stumbling block of they just don't sound real enough and then lo and behold i did uh, back then i think i had a crack copy of vienna but it was a similar thing that really close mic really crisp really clean you had to work with it a lot to make it sound human Mm -hmm. uh where and then i've got spit for album i admit, admit that was quite a few years later but you know and all of a sudden I had an entire string section that sounded like an entire string section recorded in the place that the string section was recorded in. Yeah. Uh, it's, and it's just, I mean, it was just really weird listening to, you know, some of those libraries that you mentioned, you kind of go, why have they recorded it like this? This is not how people record stuff in, in real life. So that's all we did with Spitfire was just said, just set the mics up exactly the same way as you always do. Use your valves, your ribbons, and let's record it to two-inch tape because we think that'll sound nice. Um, and we'll worry about getting rid of the noise. And, um, and you know, there's all of this argument, well, no, but it, it means it's less versatile because you can't put it in any room. And it's like, well, you can't put something that's close mic'd into any room because it doesn't... I mean, you listen to the difference between a tuba close mic'd and in a room... Um, it's, you've got to understand that it's 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 they're not it, they're not separate from each other. They're you know the room is is like the guitar. Um, you know it's like the amplifier. You know, yeah. it's so the resonating um, chamber. Well, it, it just absolutely is. And, yeah. and and these these you cannot imitate. You can put a tail on it, a reverb tail, but it's not it's not the same as a room. Um, so I think it's 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 really important. And yeah, I mean, it's the same when people ask me about, you know, recording from home and it's like, well, I think the mistake everyone makes, which makes it sound like it's recorded at home, is worrying about the noisy traffic outside and, and just putting the mic too close. It's like, well, it's, you record the air, not the instrument, really. The, the instrument moves the air and you need to record the air. Um, so, you know, yeah. Yeah. I am a big fan of getting very close with my recordings, admittedly. <laughs> but that's because I like to I like to hear those things like the grit of the bow or yeah. the nail picking on the strings, you know, that type of stuff. But uh yeah, if, but wouldn't you say it's difficult, you know, for example, if I get a violinist to play on top of samples, so I'm gonna bury that in and make it sound like a just a pronounced leader. If it's close mic, I think it's really difficult to do that. I think. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it is. I, th- I think there's there's there is a part of me that wants someone to know that there's a real player. Yeah. On there. <laughs> you know, that, guys, I got someone real on here. It's not just all samples, you know. Uh, but yes, I agree. I th- but the thing is, I think that then we go into this whole other world of where mixing and composition collide. And for me, mixing is always been the ugly stepbrother you know (laughs) that i've struggled to get along with because i've refused because it took me a long time to realize composition and mixing are essentially the same thing yes um i mean what what's your approach to mixing well again i i had a recording studio for about four years in the days of adat those very dark days um and so taught myself how to mix, but I didn't, I'm just not very good at reading manuals or, or magazines because they just make me buy too much. So um, 
it's just relying on your ears. So I always laugh when I open Sound on Sound and it says how to EQ a kick drum. And it's like, it's, it reminds me of something my brother said. He's a very good chef. And I said to him, how long do Brussels sprouts take? And he went, until they're done. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, yeah, it's just like, well, you EQ it until it sounds good. Um, and um, I also think, again, I, I'm, you know, if, if the sounds that you're using are good, you don't really need to do that much work. It's, it's more about balance than anything. And I think that my general rule in music, whether that be composing, arranging, orchestrating or mixing, is if you're having to add lots of stuff to make it right, you're definitely going in the wrong direction. Whereas taking away subtraction is, for me, uh, the key. So something I'm very interested in um, is I, I've got this project piano book and we've done a lot of... Um, um, these massive collaborations of people making like hundreds of people making sample instruments. And what we found is we had to notch out the fundamental of every note. Um, otherwise it just becomes this overwhelming, you get this kind of uh, frequency peaking on the actual note that they're playing. And if you want to hear the character of everything, you need to kind of get rid of the note. Um, and um, so, you know, it's, it's sub subtraction, not addition is, would be my, that would be my recommendation. That's really interesting, isn't it? Yeah, so that's something that sounds a good a good experiment is if your string sound, I mean, I wouldn't mess with string sounds at all, to be perfectly honest, but if, say, for example, your str string sound is just, you know, in the mix sounding a little bit muffled, then instead of shelving up the uh, the, the top end, shelve down the rest and uh yeah nice absolute gems here guys you're listening to this <laughs> i mean you, you so you mentioned uh you mentioned piano book now uh i know for a fact most of my if not all of my audience use piano book but uh what's the story behind the creation of piano it's book? bonkers so i it's it's like stream of consciousness um if vic reeves came up with a sample library idea it would be this but basically i wanted to make a, a, an album and i've got this um youtube channel and i was like how can i find time to make an album if i've got a youtube channel well what i can do is involve the community in making that album and then i thought but there's all sorts of publishing complications if i get people to contribute music so why don't I get them to contribute single notes? I thought, yeah, why don't I make a, a sample library where people send in um, uh, samples? And then I thought, well, what about if we were to make people, uh, uh, ask people to maybe sample an instrument and I made an album with all of these instruments? And then I thought, what's the easiest thing to sample? It's not easy to sample well, but it the, is the easiest thing to sample is probably a piano because it's essentially switches going on and off. So I, I set up this thing called Piano Book. It's a place that you can sample your piano and I'm going to do a, a minimalist piano album um, with all of these sounds. and. Um, I launched it and it just, there was an appetite for it and it just kicked off. And then someone completely correctly pointed out to me that it was a bit kind of bourgeois because not many people have access to real pianos. Um, so we just said, oh, well, it can be any instrument. And we've now got a thousand free instruments on there made by the community and people are getting really good at sampling. So there's some great stuff in there. And we recently did a poll for the whole community, it's about 100,000 people now, um, about what is the most important part of it that you're looking for in a sample. And, six, and you know, and it was a multiple choice of about 10 answers. And 60% of people, so the biggest chunk of the pie chart said character. And it's just, a, it's just this project that's full of character. And what, what I love about it, the romance I love, uh, and there is romance in sampling, it's boring, but it's, there's a romance in it, is, is particularly with, say, for example, you know, live instruments. Uh, I'll use the example of a piano, but, you know, pianos die. They have this soundboard that's crowned 
in a, it's just a very, it, um, it's held at tension in a curve. And over time, that crown disappears, which basically means the instrument becomes less resonant and not particularly attractive sounding. So pianos last for about a hundred year, years, but like wines, they kind of peak. And what I love about sampling is, is you capture the sound of that piano on that day and it'll never sound like that again. It'll sound similar, um, but not quite the, the, the same. And the great thing about all of these wonderful instruments people play is they, they bear, bear their kind of scars and bruises of every single person who's played them. Um, and that's what I find just fascinating that someone, you know, yesterday morning sampled themselves playing a piano in New Zealand and I'm now playing that person, playing that piano yesterday in New Zealand, in Edinburgh today. When you put it, put it like that, it does sound like a beautiful story, doesn't it? I think they call it time travel. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, I'm sure everyone knows this, but you, are, you have a YouTube channel. I do. And um, I really like the story of why that was created. Uh, but... Uh, I think a lot of us love watching your YouTube content because of the exact reason I'm enjoying this interview. You're very passionate about what you talk about and it's catching. So can we start with just as to why you started your YouTube channel? Because obviously I used to watch your your Spitfire tutorials. You know, mm-hmm. you'd you'd show us how you wrote the audio demos and you'd, you'd then go off on one about how much you love Steve Reich, which, you know, yeah which at the time I was like, yeah, me too. This is great. You know? <laughs> um, well, there's a couple of reasons I set up a YouTube channel. One was I did a tutorial for a Spitfire library and I had a dartboard with darts in it, but also a picture of Donald Trump on the dartboard. <laughs> and people took umbrage to me politicizing Spitfire marketing materials. And in retrospect, they were absolutely right. So it was like, mm, well, I want to air my views because I'm worried about my kids. Uh, so that was one reason. The other was that I, I started walking a lot in Edinburgh, and I find it the, the best way to create inspiration. So um, I basically would come down inspired with ideas for Spitfire, fire them off to uh, the now CEO, Will, and he just said, they're all great ideas, but we can't do everything. We need to find you a creative um, outlet if you thought of setting up a YouTube channel and there's a third kind of spear to this and not something I've been totally honest about until recently was that I became disillusioned with media composition and basically gave up um, and my wife wisely said don't announce that you've given up because you might go back to it and why don't you just work with people that you like and um, and that's what I've been doing ever since. And I'm now incredibly busy as a media composer. Again, I've just met more nice people. Um, but so it gave me, I just thought, well, if I have a YouTube channel, I've taken myself out of the media composition marketplace, then surely I can be really, really candid and honest about, you know, the plague of narcissism that runs through show business and, and how to recognize it and how to deal with it. Um, and, you know, how to deal with mental health and all of that kind of stuff. The one episode my agent really hated me making was how to work on several jobs simultaneously, which is the, uh, you know, we, we, we mustn't speak of this. Um, and, yeah, so I basically I set out to be really honest about the industry, but I didn't want to be one of those middle-aged, oh, it's not like the good old days. So I keep it positive. But, you know, I'd say I grew up as as a human when I became a dad. And that was the point that I accepted that that I worked in music. That was that was how I earned money to feed my daughter. And um, so passion comes from the fact that I can't do anything else. And my, our lives depend on it. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, now. I talk about mental health quite a lot on this podcast uh, because I I used to suffer from anxiety. Well, I think everyone still I still suffer from anxiety. Just it comes and goes, uh, ebbs and flows, uh, and you know suffer from depression, uh, sort of late teens, early twenties. Um, now I I'm quite curious as to 
what you would look back on your years as a composer and say, what were your darkest points? Mm -hmm. And was there anything you did to lift yourself out of those or, you know, a sequence of things? Yeah, well, I was diagnosed about two years ago with general anxiety disorder um, and kind of off the charts as well. You know, the, the person who, who um, diagnosed me was kind of quite surprised that I was functioning. Um, and so, yeah, I think for me, if I had talked to more people more honestly, I would have established that I wasn't just mad in inverted commas, that I actually had a, a, a you know, a biochemical issue that um, doesn't lend well to working under pressure for deadlines. And I think the biggest mistake that I made, which absolutely compounded the problem, was I worked too hard and worked too too long hours. Um, And um, it's just just an absolute fool's errand. And I know highly professional composers who still do the 18-hour days, and I know of many, many you know, like A-listers who have had burnout and have had to go into recovery and, you know, go to those, um, you know, to like places like the Priory and stuff like that, not for, not for alcohol or drug addiction, but for work addiction. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just, it's just totally unnecessary. Any one of you listening today, just Google how many hours of the day can a human being be productive? And you will have hundreds of um, uh, um, different articles you can read, and they will always say, and they all will say rather, at a stretch, three and a half hours. So what I do is I go for a walk to have a little think about what I'm going to do today. I, um, I, I switch all of the distractions, phone, social media, all of that gets switched off. I sit down, I work for four hours, including a little tea break maybe in the middle, on a pee break. Um, and then that's my working day done. And I'm doing more than I've ever done. Firstly, thank you for sharing that. Uh, and secondly, you know, being very open as well. Uh, secondly, that advice is absolute gold, you know? Well, that's the other thing that I, uh, if I have one regret, is, is those long hours. I remember I, I had a studio in a basement uh, in a recording complex called Nomis. Uh, yeah, Nomis. Um, and um, I didn't see the daylight for two years. So now as a consequence, when I go out in the sun, I just burn. Um, so basically I, I lost all of my ability to protect myself from the sun. Wow. So there's a real physical effect. And I have no doubt that I've taken months, if not years, off my life, which is, it's just ridiculous. Um, The the thing that we all have to understand, um, there's, if I've met literally thousands of composers, and for all of the successful composers I've met, there's no such thing as an overnight success. It simply doesn't happen. So you have to prepare for the long haul. And, you know, I often say, after leaving college, you know, I'd say it's about 10 years until you can expect to live totally off your earnings as a composer. And there are many ways of finding ways of earning money, whether that be orchestrating for people, programming, assisting, um, all of that kind of stuff. So you don't have to go and get an awful day job that takes you further away from the music industry. But you've just got to think about, well, how are you going to survive those 10 years and how are you going to survive beyond and that is to be incredibly pragmatic about what you do. And I think that what really ties in with anxiety, Richard, is, is that um, you, you doubt everything that you do. And um, I think it just needs to get to the point where if someone has said, I want you to work on this for me, they have done it for a reason and they have their faith in you. So if, even if you don't have faith in yourself, you need to respect that person's faith. So I, in those four hours, I go with my first instincts and I don't go to version three or four or 16. I'd rather do that with the director. Um, and it was quite funny because yesterday I did something that was totally wrong. Um, and today I listened to it and went, okay, now you need to do that again. Um, but in just instead of kind of going, there's a better melody, there's something cleverer or I've done that before. It's like, yeah, and that's what they're, they're paying you to do, stuff that you do. 
Um, so, yeah, that I've I, basically it was it was very good for me to take this hiatus because it made me, you know. And I guess the YouTube was kind of like therapy in many respects, but it made me realise that maybe it wasn't the other people's fault. Maybe it was my attitude. And it was born of this hideous anxiety. Until very recently, I um, I used to wake up at three, four o'clock every morning. And now I don't. And I'm a much better husband and a much better dad. Well, that's huge. That's big. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I think anyone listening, uh, obviously this doesn't come across as medical advice or anything, but uh, it's it's really nice for me to hear you say that. You know, uh, honestly, you've kind of been one of my heroes oh, thank you. with regard to a lot of stuff. So hearing you say that, I go, oh, thank goodness, it's not just me, you know. It's, it's, it's really weird that we have somehow separated the brain from rest, the rest of the body. And, you know, I think if I were to say to your audience, listen, I wouldn't start smoking if I were you because you'll become massively unhealthy and it's really difficult to give up. Well, if I were to say I wouldn't work 18-hour days and only sleep three hours a night because it's likely to cause mental illness, somehow it's like, oh, no, 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 it doesn't matter. My brain works differently. It's just like saying, well, smoking's not going to affect me. (laughs) How do you know? (laughs) It affects literally everyone else. Um, So I just, I think that you've got to be, you know, pragmatic. And something that I have actually noticed since um, the, this massive uh, uh, recorrection that's going on with female composers is there's a lot more pragmatism there. There's a lot less kind of uh, nihilism. Um, And it's, you know, it's, you know, people working proper hours and there are a lot of mums who are hugely successful composers. And it's about creating those boundaries for, for yourself. Mm. Yeah. That, that one creating boundaries, it, you have to be super honest with yourself. Uh, and also it's very, very difficult. You know, this is, you know, it's all about sort of surrounding yourself with nice people to work with. It's having people around you that will respect those boundaries that you implement. You know, I, I'm not, I can't work on the weekend because it's the weekend and I want to be with my family. <laughs> Basically, I think a real red flag, if someone doesn't accept you spending time with your family, uh, then you, sh- you shouldn't be working for them. Um, uh, I, I mean, the biggest regret, and I, you know, if I could go back and beat myself up, I would. But I, I read an email whilst on honeymoon and it was basically a director saying, if you don't come back to London and sort this thing out, um, uh, I'm going to ha- have to let you go. And I left my honeymoon to um, go for this meeting with him. And he was four hours late to it. And he said, no, I absolutely love everything. Um, I was just wondering, you know, if we could have a little go on this thing. And it was just a total power play. And it's just, it's just, it's, you know, it's crap. You know, a, a word to the wise. Um, if if you walk into the room feeling okay about yourself, if you walk into a room feeling okay about yourself, and if you walk out of that room not feeling okay about yourself, it's likely that you've been the subject of narcissistic attack. And the best advice that I have for um, uh, uh, dealing with people with narcissism is to not be with them. Yes. Have you got any uh, indicators for those people who don't know what a narcissistic person would behave like or well a narcissistic person is part of the cluster b of personality disorders um so you have antisocial you have borderline you have histrionic and you have narcissistic what unifies all of those personality disorders is that they lack the ability to empathize it's not that they don't empathize much they can't and this is what makes, you know, why a lot of CEOs are narcissists, because they can fire people and it just not bother them. Um, and uh, the, the show business attracts a lot of narcissists. And the best job for a narcissist is being a director. Um, so they, there was a kind of a breed of auteuristic um, directors that I think are, are on the wane because people are a lot more no nonsense. You know, this is a... This is an industry. You know, we've got Netflix asking us for material, Amazon, Apple 
And they won't have these directors going, oh, I'm not going to deliver this and I'm going to, you know, lock the edit so you can't see it, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, narcissists are just basically, um, uh, they care about themselves and uh, they care about you if you provide them with narcissistic supply. Um, if you make them look good, if you make them feel good. Um, and what they're very good at doing is being abusive at one point and very nice at another point. They can be incredibly charismatic. And what happens is you, you start, start getting this kind of desire to please them because when you displease them, it's horrible. When you please them, it's really, it's like, oh. Um, so yeah, it's um, it's a, just that they they can, what they, what they do to their victims is they erode them. And you can really find yourself losing who you are because what, narcissists do is they're not actually happy with who who they are so what they do is they project out onto you um what they're feeling about themselves and a great example of that is uh, mr donald trump who, who just would say what he was doing by going well i think you know that democrat is a is a russian mark it's like no you're the russian mark <laughs> I love I love the avenue we have taken on this. Yeah, sorry, that was that was a. I, I I've in my family that there is a uh, there's a, a strain of this cluster B um, uh, uh, thing, and uh, it's just something really really. I mean, ten percent of the population suffer from it, so it's just well worth looking into. NPD, if you look, look on the Wikipedia site, it, it really does explain it, and um, you've just got to watch out for it. I, I've got a trick. Um, I went to six years of therapy about cluster B and the fact that basically I seem to attract people. And um, someone said, oh, who was that ex-girlfriend? What was her name? And I said her name and I said, but of course um, she changed it. And he went, they all do. I went, what? And he went, cluster Bs, they all change their names. So a really, really good red flag is if someone's called something like Mark Smooth you know, it's likely that wasn't their birth name and they're a narcissist. Do you know what? The entire audience are listening to this going, hold on. Yes. Rich, hold on. Richard. Yeah. <laughs> and it can be subtle. Like I had a, I had a, a friend who was a narcissist who was called Marcos, but I actually noticed on his, his um, uh, uh, passport, he's called Marcus. So it's, it can be like you know. Yeah, I just I just want to highlight that. Although I, everyone knows me as Richard Shriver, my real name is Richard Prynne. It's a, it was to do with exclusivity, guys. I knew, <laughs> I knew. <laughs> no. Yeah, you're going to see my dark side now, Christian. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but in all seriousness, just 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 to, just to drop back in on this this mental health thing it is. Um, you do really, really have to take it seriously. And when you're young, you really can punish yourself, but it, it can come up and bite yourself on the arse. And if you do start feeling very low, um, or listless, or you know, suffering from panic attacks, that kind of stuff, just go and seek help. It's out there. Something I would really recommend for anxiety is a thing called CBT, because it's not limitless. It's not like therapy. Um, and that has changed me as a human being. Yes. Um, it, my wife and I did CBT um, yeah. and that helped tremendously, tremendously. And I think it's also really important. I, I think that, you know, true creative people are actually quite rare. And if you feel that you are a genuine creative person, it'll be, I think it's almost like a mutation, like having red hair is. It's, I think we're short a filter or two. So what we do is we're highly imaginative, but we can also turn imaginative ideas into something. And I think because we've removed those or, or those filters aren't there, we also get the rough end of the wedge as well, which basically means dark thoughts, going to dark places, imagining dark things. So I don't be embarrassed by the fact that you have these lights and shades it's i think it kind of goes with the territory mm. it's like any super super you know superhero isn't it the from whatever angle you're looking at their superpower can be a good thing or a bad thing you know mm. 
it's learning to harness it and and you're right it's those your imagination you know my experience of it is that my imagination goes to creative storytelling on the inside you yeah. know yeah. putting stories on other people's actions and then you get the emotional responses and all this but it's stopping that story and yeah and out for me it's outcomes what is going to be the outcome of this and i imagine five different scenarios and it's like, well, four of those are definitely not going to happen, but probably all five aren't. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a terrible waste of, um, waste, waste of energy. And I think one of the best, best cures for all of those kind of invasive thoughts and, and depression and um, uh, 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 anxiety can often, you know, the first port of call can often be just getting some exercise and getting some proper sleep. Um, and then talking to people and getting help when you need it. Right. I'm very aware that you are a super busy man, Christian. So I don't want to take your, and as much as I'm absolutely loving this conversation, I don't want to take too much more of your time. So um, I love how open you've just been. That was, you know, fantastic to hear, you know, and as a, as a fellow human being, it's nice because it resonates, you know, hearing what you went through resonates with, with me as well. So, and a, and a fellow Brit, <laughs> Us Brit boys don't really usually open up like this. No, we don't. Well, actually it's funny you talk about that. <laughs> well, you know, what was really interesting is I remember the first time I had a panic attack and I didn't know what was happening. I just had no idea. And I suffered from chronic panic attacks for about two years and I was trying to explain the sensation to someone and they said, oh, that's a panic attack. And I went, oh, it's a thing. And it's like, so, you know, by talking about it, people don't feel alone and don't feel, I was just convinced I was going to die all the time, yeah. that I had something wrong with my brain, you know. Yeah. You're either going to randomly suffocate or sick yourself to sleep in some way. Yeah. Just one thing that, that my CBT therapist um helps me with with panic attacks it's the thing that happens in panic attacks is you think you're going to die from the panic attack but the reason you're panicking is it's actually your body keeping you alive and no one dies from panic attacks if they did there would be piles of bodies <laughs> next to roller coasters <laughs> he's absolutely right yeah and that that has just that thought of you know the reason why my hands are tingling is because I'm I'm breathing too much and I'm not um, what's I'm not exhaling the carbon dioxide, mm. and um, I'm not going to die because I'm having a panic attack and that kind of lifts me out of it. Anyway, yeah. so that's my top tip of the day, <laughs> dude. Uh, there was like at least twenty top tips in this <laughs> in this chat. Uh, you know, I'm going to be listening back to this with a pen and paper. That's the only thing about hosting a podcast is I feel rude grabbing a pen and paper and writing it down. <laughs> Um, Christian, I've absolutely loved having you on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. And, uh, those of you listening, I didn't record my fanboying before the show, but I do want to just reiterate how important, you know, like for instance, your felt piano were for my career. And also, from, as you say, the work you do for my inspiration, um, and it's, it is that butterfly effect. And I think you do a tremendous amount of service for our community, uh, of composers admittedly mine's a very niche community of, of composers for trailers but uh it was really lonely when i started out and um it doesn't need to be drop the mic <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think you're you're absolutely right and this is i say this constantly this is why i started the podcast my course is all this because when i started I couldn't reach out to anybody. And, and even, you know, this was what, 2004. And I, there were hardly any resources. This was my state, my space, you know, and I, no one would reply to me on my space. And, you know, it was, you're right. It was yeah. lonely. So it's. It, there's something that I think that you will probably, if you were to go back through all of your birth stories on this podcast and all of the birth stories that you've asked, how did you get into composing? There'll be one thing that will be, uh, that will unite them all. There'll be one common thing that will happen in every one of those birth stories. At some point, they will mention another composer's name. So for me, it was Anne Dudley and then Rupert and then Harry Gregson Williams. And um, 
there's always a composer who helps at some stage in the process. So getting to know other composers is uh, uh, basically a box you need to tick. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. If you say that, and I, th- I kind of go, oh, yeah, there was a name, every single one of them. Or actually, not just a name, multiple names. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, Christian, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. And I, I know you've given so much advice already, but I do like to ask if there was one parting piece of advice you could give to aspiring composers or even composers who have reached that point which i'm sure resonates with you as well as it does with me where you feel like you've plateaued uh, and you're losing direction i know they're two separate camps but i feel like actually there's an innate similarity between the two so what's your one piece of advice parting don't, advice I should don't say. buy don't buy commercial sample libraries <laughs> yeah A microphone hit something, make a sample. Uh, you know, the, the, the creating your own voice is absolutely... It, 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 people will hire you for, for you. They want unique. As Oscar Wilde said, be yourself, everyone else is taken. And a way that you can really easily create your own voice is not by studying, oh, I'm going to do an octatonic thing or this, whatever. It's just going and banging your refrigerator and turning it into something. And... Um, and I think that that will get you out of so many pickles, knowing that you can get inspiration from the world around you and you can create a sound that no one else has. I think that would be my one piece of advice. Excellent advice. And we're going to get hundreds of refrigerator libraries coming out very soon. <laughs> <laughs> And there we go. Thank you so much, Christian, for coming on the show. And guys, thank you so much for listening. I absolutely loved that conversation with Christian. It was super, super cool. And like I said, massive fanboy moment for me. Um, And of course, if you guys are enjoying the show, can you please go and give this a five-star rating or, you know, follow it, subscribe, you know. Uh, sing from the rooftops as to how awesome this show is uh, because it helps me be found in search and generally it it just feels nice to see that someone likes what I'm doing (laughs) anyway you guys are rock stars uh, and uh, I will see you in the next episode Amazing.